<laughs> okay, now I have the privilege of introducing our speaker for revival both tonight and tomorrow. Uh, Bruce Templeton actually worked on staff as a youth minister at Horse Pastor Christian Church back in 1977 and 78. I think he was some of y'all's youth minister maybe. Not mine, but it was some of y'all's youth minister. I know that because some people had shared that. We are excited to have Bruce back. Bruce has been in ministry uh, since then on, worked in California for how many years, Bruce? 20, 25 years. He was a minister in California, and now he's coming to us from Union Christian Church in Cynthia, Kentucky, and we are thrilled to have you back. We thank you for being here. Let's please give a welcome to Brother Bruce Templeton. Looking forward to this. It, it, it's good to be back. <laughs> uh, so, uh, some of y'all thought that this day would never come again, did you? <laughs> you, you, uh, you thought we were done with him 45 years ago, right? Uh, <laughs> I keep holding on. <laughs> it, is a, it is a joy. It really, really, really is for me to be back here again. Um, uh, I'm old now. I, I, know, I know you find that hard to believe, but I'm old now. And, uh, and uh, I, I, <laughs> I'm bleeding. So uh, <laughs> that happens to us old people. I know you young people don't understand that, but... Somebody can look at you wrong and you'll just start bleeding, you know? I'm not on blood thinners or anything, I, you know? Uh, 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 well, have you, well, look here. Uh, uh, first aid, first aid, you know? We'll go to commercial, okay. It might be Paw Patrol, but that's okay. <laughs> Okay, this is Paw Patrol. Anybody got a Star Wars Band-Aid I can use, huh? Huh? <laughs> uh, I'm going to... I thought I had it stopped, and then when I, you know, and then it wasn't. Uh, just, yeah. Hey, turn around and tell somebody you're glad they're here while I do this, all right? <laughs> See? <laughs> now, now, I really hope that doesn't distract you all, okay? <laughs> I, I tell you what, I'll hold my Bible in my right hand and you won't see it that much, all right? <laughs> okay. I, uh, it is good to uh, be back. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. When uh, I think Dave called me and asked me uh, if I would be interested in doing this, uh, I said, absolutely. I'd love to be back and, and visit and, and share. Uh, and I think I figured out, uh, I, I spoke for the 150th. Huh? Right? Where? Yeah, I think. Yeah, 1998. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm probably not going to make it back here in another 25 years, Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. <laughs> and I look around here. I said, some of y'all got old, you know. <laughs> Not me. Uh, I better get started or we'll be here all night. Uh, there was a show uh, uh, several years ago. Uh, and it, I think it started out on network TV uh, and ended up on TLC, the uh, learning channel, called Who Do You Think You Are? Any of y'all ever watch that? I, I forget the girl's name. Uh, uh, Lisa Tudrow. Yeah? Who? Yeah, that's, yeah, I said it right. That's, that's my wife of 48 years, Connie, sitting right there. Uh, and yeah, she was here with me, too, 45 years ago. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, Kudrow, it was with a K. I said with a T. Thank you. I, 
I have hearing aids too. That just shows how, much, how old I am because I still can't hear with them. Uh, I don't know what good they do. Connie says, these keep me from talking so loud. <laughs> but I don't think that's true either. <laughs> uh, okay, so who do you think you are? That's what we're talking you know, and, and it was a, a celebrity show. She would do work with Ancestry.com and Ancestry and all these things and, and trace the lineage and the ancestry and the heritage of celebrities. And I mean, there were some interesting stories. Some of them you just wouldn't believe, uh, uh, compelling stories. Uh, and what always struck me funny, uh, odd, uh, was that as, as, they would, as they would go through this, these, these people didn't even know who, many of them didn't even know who their grandparents were. I, you know, I, I, we never talked about my grandparents. I thought, how does, that, how does that happen? How do you do that, you know? Let alone grandparents or great-great-grandparents. Uh, I thought that was odd. Uh, and Finding Your Roots, I think, is the show that's on PBS. Same premise. He has celebrities, and he traces all their ancestry and, and, uh, and, and gives them these compelling stories of the uh, lineage and heritage of these uh, celebrity people. Um, same premise on both shows, and, and everybody's gotten into it. I don't know if you're into it. Connie and I, you know, Connie's done a whole lot of work on, on, on my family tree. I said, don't shake that too hard. <laughs> We're not sure who's going to fall out of that thing. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, uh, this, I found this quote. I don't know who is responsible. It was anonymous when I read it, but I wanted to share it. Your fulfillment in life goes up, and your fear goes down, when you know exactly who you are and where you come from. There's a lot to be said about your heritage, about your legacy, about your ancestry, because, you know, your, fear go, your life uh, goes up, your fear goes down. When you know who you are and where you come from. It's another interesting thing that over the course of these studies, and I've watched a lot of them, uh, family history repeats itself. You know, uh, through generations, over and over again, they're, you know, they do some of the same kind of things. They end up living in the same place or going to the same place. I mean, it's kind of amazing generationally how each generation kind of repeats things of the previous generation, characteristics, behavior from generation to generation. I'm going to show you a little bit about my ancestry, okay? And this isn't a joke, okay? <laughs> I can put, yeah, okay. This is my dad, <clears throat> William Glenn Templeton. He passed away August 1st, 2016, at 88 years old. Uh, he, uh, he, and all, he, well, I'll get to that. He, he went to what was called Falls Creek Church of Christ. That's the church he was born into, and, and he was baptized in Coal River, West Virginia, okay? And that was a river that ran right in front of our house, and we had the sandbar where all the churches that baptized people the Bible way. <laughs> Just thought I'd get that in there. Uh, you know, they had to come to a place where there was much water. And our sandbar on our property, on our farm, had that uh, much water and a place you could navigate and get in. So my dad was baptized in Coal River on our family farm. This next picture, this is my great, or my grandparents. This is Henry and Nora Templeton. Uh, by the way, my dad uh, was a leader in our home church. Uh, uh, he was at, from Falls Creek Church, but then they moved into town, and he was an elder at the Gateway uh, Church of Christ in St. Albans uh, for like 50-plus uh, years. This is my grandfather, Henry and Nora Templeton. My grandfather and Nora went to Falls Creek Church of Christ. So I'm talking about generations repeating stuff, you know. They were from Falls Creek Church of Christ. They were both baptized in Coal River on my grandfather's dad's farm at that time, but the same sandbar, the same river, and the same spot. Wasn't the same water because rivers. <laughs> I just want I want you to know I'm not ignorant, okay? Uh, <laughs> but they were both baptized in that same river in that same spot. My grandfather went on to be, he was an elder at the Falls Creek Church of Christ. They served there for most of their life until they moved into town when we went into town a few years later. And, uh, and so uh, that's my grandparents. This is the uh, next picture is my great grandfather. That's Aquila Templeton. Yeah, that was his name, a cool name, Aquila. He was a member of Falls Creek Church of Christ. He was baptized in the Coal River and, uh, and this next, last picture is uh, 
This is my great, great grandfather, Leftridge King. I'm going to throw you off because you, uh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> he not only uh, was uh, a member of Falls Creek Church of Christ, I don't know that he was baptized because we didn't own that property <laughs> yet. So I'm not sure where Leftridge was baptized, but not only was he a member of Falls Creek Church of Christ, he actually donated the land that first a Falls Creek Church of Christ was built on. Um, I was, I, listen, I, I was a modern baptism. I got baptized in a baptistry at Gateway Church of Christ. I wasn't baptized in the Cold River. I swam in the Cold River. <laughs> but that's, here's the thing, you know. Uh, I, five, you talk about generations repeating, repeating, repeating. Um, I am fifth generation. Um, but Leftridge King, uh, my great great grandfather, fought with uh, General John Hunt Morgan. I, was, I gotta tell you this because it, it won't cost anything extra, okay? Uh, they, they, uh, John Hunt Morgan was a Kentucky uh, Confederate soldier that raided Union camps in, in Kentucky and Ohio. And, and uh, in his second campaign of 1864, my great-great-grandfather joined him, John Hunt Morgan, Morgan's Raiders, uh, the 10th Cavalry. And, uh, and, and as they were moving through, going across Kentucky to get into, across the river into Ohio, they bivouacked on a piece of land in Clark County, Kentucky. Um, Connie's dad bought that farm, unbeknownst to any of us, that that's where my great-great-grandfather had actually bivouacked with John Hunt Morgan. And I literally bought, I had two, uh, 54 acres that I, we built our house on, and I was literally sleeping on the same dirt that my great-great-grandfather slept on back in 1864. I just thought that's a little extra there. It didn't cost you nothing, okay? Uh, anyway, generations repeat. I'm fifth generation uh, out of Falls Creek Church of Christ, uh, the early, earliest days of the uh, restoration movement. Our whole history revolves around church, and that has been repeated generation from generation to generation, and all my nieces and nephews are all engaged and involved, not in ministry, but they are attending and very active and involved in churches to this day. So six generations of our family passed on from one generation to the next, and, and uh, I, I don't, I, I'm not bragging, but I am a little bit, you know, uh, but just to say, that's what happens. As things get passed from one generation, certain things, certain traditions, certain routines, certain beliefs, certain values get transferred from one generation to the next. Uh, you say, why is that important? For this reason, your fulfillment in life goes up and your fear goes down when you, when you know exactly who you are and where you come from. We're celebrating here this weekend 175 years of service in the kingdom of God. Uh, yeah. And honestly, I've, I've served in a lot of old churches, not just old people, <laughs> but old churches. Uh, I, you know, uh, when I left here, I went to Ruddles Mills uh, Christian Church uh, and was minister there. They started in, in 1841, okay? Uh, my, the church I was in California for 25 years. They were established in 1895. It's one of the oldest Christian, independent Christian churches in the state of California, you know. Uh, I like to say the oldest and, and biggest. <laughs> and, and maybe we were. I, you know, uh, see me later, I'll explain that. Uh, but we're on, and I'm honored to be a part of that. I'm not just honored to be a part of this weekend. I want you to know I am honored to be a part of the history of this great church. Uh, Second oldest that I have served, uh, 1848, 175 years. Uh, and I, Clyde Holland was a charter member of that first church, you know? <laughs> huh? <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that out there, you know? <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're still buddies, I was kidding. <laughs> uh, and here from 77 to 78, and, and I look around and I see kids in the youth group uh, that were here when I was here. God bless you for being here tonight. 
Uh, and amazingly, uh, I recognize most of you, you know, because, well, because we're older. <laughs> Not old, we're just older. And, uh, but it's good to see you all, uh, everybody. It's just great. And the new folks, some of you have introduced yourself to, to me, and, and I appreciate it. That's all a part of this rich history. And, and life goes up and fear goes down when you know exactly where you've come from. And I want to talk about where, where we've come from, where Horse Pasture Christian Church comes from. And I'm talking something that predates 1848. See, some 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover when the, Jesus rose from the dead, 50 days later from that Passover, uh, the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came in wind and fire and empowered the apostles to speak in languages of this massive crowd that had gathered in Jerusalem for Pentecost. They knew how to throw a party. And they had a party. And there were thousands upon thousands of people who had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the 50. And, and, and uh, uh, I'll throw you a little, give you a little insight. Uh, the 50 days, because I thought, what's such a big deal about 50 days? You know, it, it, like, you know, what's 50 days? As it turns out, it was estimated that it took them 50 days to get out of Egypt and get to Mount Sinai. And they received the law on the 50th day. And so they celebrated Pentecost, 50, Pente, 50 days after Passover when they received the law of Moses and God's law on Mount Sinai. And that's why Pentecost was such a big deal. So everybody came back to Jerusalem to celebrate. And it was at that day that God sent the Holy Spirit in wind and fire. They spoke in languages. And the Bible tells us that after they were through preaching, Peter was through preaching that day, 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus Christ and were baptized into him. That's what it says. Along the way, as the church grew there in Jerusalem, it's estimated by some scholars that, that there were 20,000 New believers, Christians living in Jerusalem, and that's why persecution came. We know Stephen was martyred. Saul was converted. Peter unlocked the door to the Gentiles and allowed them into the kingdom of God. And while eventually everybody was on board with that idea, there was still segregation among those early believers. They had these religious and cultural hangups that made it almost impossible for them to preach to anybody but Jewish people. But the Holy Spirit was still active and working among God's people. And we see that in Acts 11 chapter. And that's where we're going to be, okay? Acts 11, 19. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, those who had been scattered traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. This is 10 or 12 years after Pentecost. Acts 11 represents about 10 or 12 years after the church had begun. And he mentions that Stephen was killed and they traveled. So the church was launched on the day of Pentecost. And this is 10 to 12 years after that. Persecution of these new believers was heating up in and around Jerusalem because the Jewish religious leaders didn't want anything to do with these new believers. And as a result of that persecution, these believers scattered you know, they got out of Dodge <laughs> or Jerusalem, okay? Well, you know, they, they left town. They said, there's better places we can be. But here's the thing. They didn't leave because of fear. They left to get out of there. And what they did is they took the gospel with them. As they were scattered, they took the gospel of Jesus Christ with them, sharing it everywhere they went. So the Bible tells us the number of disciples is increasing, multiplying, actually. Look at verse 20. Some of them, however men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also. Uh-oh. <laughs> Telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. This is incredible. Cyprus is an island which uh, is off the coast of Phoenicia, which is where Antioch is located. Cyrene is a town on the northern tip of Egypt, some 700 miles away from Antioch. I just want you to think about that for a second, 700 miles. Some, to give you perspective, you know, just give you some perspective on how far that is. That would be that if you started walking from here today and you walked to Boston, Massachusetts, that's 700 miles. Or you want to go south if you went from here and walked all the way to Miami Beach, that's 700 miles. Or if you want to get out of the country altogether, Ottawa, Canada, 700 miles. <laughs> Chicago is just inside 700 miles. 
So these guys left uh, Cyrene, uh, which is on the northern tip of Egypt, made their way, walked up to Antioch, 700 miles, in order to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you're saying, why Antioch of all places? Well, Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. There was Rome, and there was Alexandria, and there was Antioch, okay? Uh, and they figured, well, okay, let's, let's, go, let's go to Antioch, you know? There's a lot of Greeks there. As it turns out, these guys that were going were Greeks, were Gentiles, and said, so let's go share the gospel. And so they converged from Cyprus and Cyrene, and they converged on Antioch. Uh, it, it was the third largest city in the Roman Empire, but it was also corrupt. It was great in influence, fabulous in wealth, strategic in position. It was a major port along the Mediterranean, cosmopolitan in atmosphere, corrupt in its morals, idolatrous in its practice, and predominantly Greek, not Jewish in population. There's no indication that these guys were preachers or elders or educated in any other way. They're just ordinary people who were on fire to tell others about Jesus Christ. And they used the persecution in the region to launch them. Where are we going to go? Uh, let's go to Antioch. What better place to start than the most corrupt city in the Roman Empire? And around the 10th chapter of Acts with Cornelius' conversion, Peter had opened the door for the Gentiles to come into the kingdom of God. And what more fertile and strategic ground could there be than a city full of pagan, godless Gentiles than Antioch? Look what it says in verse 21. It says, the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. God was blessing their effort. He was, he was blessing their commitment. He was blessing their message. And as a result of that, a great number of people were brought to the Lord. But it wasn't just about their belief. A great number of people believed. That's what Luke tells us. And it's not, it's not, it's not just about their belief. Because in my experience, and I'm pretty sure yours too, there are a lot of people who believe. Who will say, well, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus, and many times they're only saying that to avoid saying, I don't believe in Jesus, right? You know, because they won't go that far. <laughs> yeah. They want to hedge on their bet a little bit. They want to say, well, it's not that I don't believe in Jesus. You know, I, I just, you know, I don't just don't go in for all of that stuff. You probably talk to somebody like that. And that's what, this is what's happening. It's not that they just believe in Jesus. In some ways, they were keeping their lives on a swivel, you know? You know, there were so many allurements and so many attractions and so much sin involved in Antioch. You know, they wanted to keep their options open, right? They're just kind of looking around, looking around. They're turning all right. <laughs> but it was not just about their belief. Oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'll see you later. I got other things to do here. It wasn't just about believing in Jesus. There's a whole bunch of people like that today, maybe in your life and, and in your sphere of influence. They, they, won't, they won't say, I don't believe in Jesus, you know, because that's, that's a little, that's across the line. But they say, I believe in Jesus and feel like then they can live however they want to. That's not what's going on in Antioch. You know, uh, uh, to say you believe in Jesus doesn't keep, uh, doesn't mean you're turning to Jesus is what I'm getting at. Uh, like in Antioch, these people, they said, yeah, okay, we believe in Jesus, but they didn't just believe in Jesus, they turned to Jesus. The message was so powerful that it led them to believe and turn to the Lord. Not just believe, but to believe and turn. You see, that whole idea is the idea of repentance and obedience. They didn't just, they said, they believed and they turned to the Lord and they turned away from all that other stuff that kept them from having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed and they turned to Jesus. See, that turning to the Lord denotes a conversion. It denotes a change in heart. It denotes a change in attitude. It denotes a change in mind, a change in action. It, it literally means to turn yourself around. I, I call it when it comes to a person committing their life to Christ and they get to repentance, I call it the big U-turn. <laughs> you know, we... 
Come on, we all love to make U-turns. You know, there's just something about it. You know, like you're breaking the law, but you're not breaking the law, you know? And some of you break the law. I, you know, when it says, no U-turn, you know, you're not supposed to do that, right? But that's what repentance is. It's I believe in Jesus, and I'm going to turn to Jesus, and I'm going to do a big U-turn in my life and turn from the life that I've been living to this point. And that's what was happening in Antioch. How do you know when you're just beyond, how do you know when you're beyond this idea of just believing? How do you know when you've gone beyond just belief? I'll tell you, when you're willing to turn your life around and turn to the Lord. That's, they believed and they turned to the Lord. Now look at this, verse 22. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Now we know Barnabas. Barnabas, his name means son of encouragement, you know. And, and so they sent him up to Antioch. Now when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Well, what about Barnabas? He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. So the leaders in Jerusalem, you know, they, they, they kind of like to keep their fingers on everything. You know, they, they, after, these were the apostles. These were the leaders in Jerusalem, you know, and they had every right to do that. And so they said, hey, we hear something's going on in Antioch. Barnabas, we want you to go up there and check it out for us. And it wasn't about to investigate or anything. He was there to encourage, to assist these new Antioch believers and let them know also that through Barnabas, these believers in Antioch, Gentile believers in Antioch had the full support of their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. And because Barnabas was a good man, full of faith and the spirit, Luke tells us a great, another great number of people were brought to the Lord. So much so that it got to the point where Barnabas said, I need some help here. This is getting out of my hands. You know, I can't do this anymore. So he goes and looks for Saul. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. I don't know if you're paying attention to what's happening here in Antioch, but verse 21 says a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Verse 24 says a great number of people were brought to the Lord. In verse 26, Barnabas and Saul taught great numbers of people. Now, here's, here's the punchline of this whole thing, okay? You said, well, okay, okay, here it is. Up until this time, 10, 12 years into the beginning of the church, from the launch of the day of Pentecost to this time in Acts, the 11th chapter, the, the followers of Jesus Christ had been called that. Followers or believers or disciples or saints or brethren or people of the way. But look at this, verse 26. Verse 26 says, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Huh? Well, why is that? We're 12 years into the starting of the church and the first time, this literally is, <laughs> here's a little pun for you, this literally is the first Christian church. <laughs> I, the, I, when, in Huntington Beach, where I was minister, we were first Christian church and we really were the first and only Christian church in town, bar none, uh, you know. We predated the city council, which I always thought that should have given us some leverage when we went to build buildings because <laughs> you're not the boss of us. <laughs> we were here before you. But, and actually somebody in zoning told me, you, you could make that a legal argument here. And I said, don't tempt me. Don't even tempt me about that. Now, it was suggested, and I've heard this, and I've heard scholars and professors and everybody say this. And I think, that, I think it's true. I don't think they're lying. I think it's true that it was suggested that this idea of Christian, uh, it, it literally translates little Christs, and that it was used by non-Christians as a derogatory term to those who were followers of Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That may have been true. It may have become true at some point, Okay but not here, not now. Because that word called, you can circle it there in your outline, circle called. This word, when it's used throughout all of scripture, it almost always is used to designate a divine calling. In other words, this term of description for those who wear the name of Jesus Christ, it didn't come on a whim. 
It, 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 didn't, it didn't come from critics or mockers. It wasn't a term of convenience to create some kind of umbrella that covered everybody who called on the name of Jesus, okay? That wasn't it at all. This name came divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. And here's the deal. I think there's an, a, an underlying reason why they were called Christians first at Antioch because all those other churches, I'm not knocking them, but all those other churches were, were an exclusive club. They were Jews only. That's, that's the only one they'd preach the gospel to. That's the only people that were baptized until now. And for the first time, 11 years after the church was established, Jew and Gentile came together in the body of Christ and that's why they were called Christians first at Antioch because they were acting like Christians. And God said, here you are. This is what a Christian looks like. And rightly so. See, as I said, the church had been a pretty exclusive group. Only Jews. Cornelius and his household, you know, Peter came to them and Peter said, I don't see any reason why these shouldn't be baptized to you. <laughs> and he baptized them and all of a sudden it wasn't such an exclusive club anymore. As a matter of fact, it was actually fulfilling the mission that Jesus gave him from the very beginning. Go into where? All the world. And that's exactly what they were doing. Stay with me on this. I, you know, you're looking at your watches. I still got a few minutes here. Okay, all right. I'm about done. I'm bringing this in for a landing, okay? Here we go. Cornelius uh, broke the barrier and probably formed their own con con congregation uh, right there in Caesarea. But Antioch, Antioch was this melting pot of cultures, religions, classes, socioeconomic strata, and most importantly, it was a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. And here they'd come together in one body, one church, overcoming all prejudices, overcoming all barriers, overcoming all distinctions, united as one. And Barnabas went and found Saul and gave him a front row seat to what God was doing, this new thing that God was doing in the city of Antioch. Paul says this, uh, when I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I do. Am I, did I find it? When I'm, yeah, when I'm with Gentiles, I do not follow the Jewish law. Okay, that, <laughs> my notes are different than the one I put on there. I too live apart from the law so that I can what? Bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. Let's go to the next one there. When I'm with those, there it is. When I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. And yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the gospel and share in its blessings. He would later write to the Galatians and say this, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all what? One in Christ Jesus. They were for the very first time, divinely called Christians that day. One more note, they're generous. See, they make it a point here in the 11th chapter to point out this Agabus who had come from Jerusalem and he was a prophet. And he gets up one day and there's all these new Christians, uh, the first Christians, first Christian church of Antioch, and they're there and he gets up and says, there's a famine coming. He was a prophet. God had told him there's a famine coming and it's going to hit the whole Roman Empire, but it's going to start over in Judea and Palestine and, and all of those, all those places over there. And they're going, to be, they're going to be hard up. It's going to be awful on them. Look what they did. The disciples, as each one was able to decide, or was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. They did this, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. These people had just come to know Jesus Christ. Before this, they were heathens, pagans, their lives on a swivel, looking for the next best thing to come along. And in a short period of time, when they hear, <laughs> when they hear of those Jewish brothers and sisters down in Jerusalem going to be having trouble and starving to death, well, after the way they treated us, forget about them. 
We were outcast. We were on the outside looking in. They didn't care about us then. Why would we care about them now? But that's not how it went. That's our human reaction, isn't it? That, you know? I'm going to give you four closing comments and I'm done. So you can fill these blanks in as we go. Going all the way back to the first half of the first century. And these characteristics, these foundational truths, these generational characteristics and values have been translated and transferred from generation to generation for over 2,000 years. And they come to you today, Horse Pastor Christian Church. This, this is ancestry stuff. This is stuff that is undeniable. When you name the name of Jesus Christ, you wear this. We wear this. They resonate through the corridors of time and they give us an eternal framework to be the church that God has called us to be. You look over the narrative, Acts 11, what we just talked about, you find the foundation upon which God's church has been built and it not only sustains the church, but it continues to advance his kingdom generation after generation until he comes. Remember what we said at the beginning? Your fulfillment in life goes up and your fear goes down when you know exactly who you are and where you come from. Here you go. Well, number one, this church has a mission. Antioch had a mission. You know, it says there in verse 19, they traveled spreading the word. These guys, uh, some of these guys traveled over 700 miles on foot to take the word of God to a pagan and decadent city. And because they were Gentiles themselves, they decided, well, we'll just go spread the word among Gentiles. That's what we'll do. You don't have to travel a thousand miles to spread the word, to be the church that Antioch was. You may just have to walk across the road or just walk across a room to be that church. This church has a message, has a message. Look in verse 20, it says they went there telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. That message is still as timeless today as it was then and will be until the Lord comes back. A message that was preached on the first day of the church, the day of Pentecost over 2,000 years ago when Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. A message that was carried to distant shores. A message that we still preach today to the lost, to the disenfranchised, and to those who are far from God. This church had a, a mission. This church has a message. Thirdly, this church has a ministry. Look at this uh, in verse 23. It says Barnabas got there and he encouraged them all. Look at this. Let's read that together. Is, have you got it? No, you don't have it there, do you? I didn't put it on there. No, you're good. Uh, to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. To remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. These believers were living in sin city. I mean literally, sin city. Now we hear about Ephesus and we hear about all those other cities and how horrible they were. Antioch beat them all because it was a conglomeration of all those things that those other cities singly focused on. Antioch had it all. And they were spreading the word. Their lives were on that swivel. There were so many distractions and so many allurements and so many things they could have done and not felt bad about it. Because <laughs> they didn't have a conscience. They didn't know guilt. They didn't know they were lost without a savior. They didn't know any of that stuff. And when they came and they preached, these guys said, hey, we're going to believe in this Jesus and not only believe, we're going to turn to him, all that distraction, all those allurements. We see that today, don't we? Seems to be a lot more today than there used to be. I don't know. I'm just old. <laughs> but I'm telling you, you know, it, it's the one thing. I don't know that I want to give all this fun up in order to give my life to Jesus. So Barnabas, the son of encouragement, encouraged these new Christians to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. That's a singular dedication and commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus in his final words to his followers told them and us to make disciples. See, our first priority is to win them to Jesus Christ. Number one priority, win them to Jesus. 
But in that process of making disciples, Jesus said, teaching them to obey everything I have taught you. See, that's what it means when he says, remain true to the Lord with all your heart. That's how you do that. You continue to grow and you continue to provide a message that allows them, believers, to grow. Provide an environment that encourages the spiritual growth of all believers. And fourth, this church was motivated by love. Motivated by love. It says the disciples decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did sending their gift, generosity. You, you know, the church not only needed to be sound in doctrine, but they needed to have love. Which Jesus said, by this will everybody know that you are my disciples, what? If you love one another. So these guys, these guys said, hey, if there's going to be a famine down there, you know, we got to send our money and help those people out. And here are these Gentiles showing their love to the Jews who had so long hated them. That's a beautiful picture of love. But that's what Christians, the first ones did. <laughs> and that's what we do. Because we wear the name Christian. And that's how Christians act toward others. And to this very day, you and I, we bear the name that is above all names. That these early brothers and sisters died to preserve the purity of the name we wear. And this wasn't a mistake. It wasn't an accident. Because when these followers of Jesus Christ who have confessed him as Lord, have surrendered him to his lordship and obey the law of Jesus Christ, those are the ones who wear that special name of Christ. Christian. And we wear the name of Christ today in the 21st century. So I'm going to encourage you tonight, if you're a Christian... You wear the name well. There's a great story of old, I, you know, I'm probably not going to get it right. <laughs> but Alexander the Great was conquering the world. And they went into battle at one point, and, and he saw, the, he sent his soldiers into the battle, except for one individual that kind of held back. And he held back, and he didn't get into the fray of the battle. He kind of stayed on the battle's edge and really didn't commit at all to the fight. And Alexander the Great saw him, brought him over, and said, what is your name, soldier? And he said, my name is Alexander. And Alexander the Great said, either change your name or change your fight, because you can't wear both. Kind of the way with Christians, right? We wear the name. If you're not going to get in the fight, if you're not going to be who Jesus has called you to be, I'm not telling you to change your name. I'm just telling you to get in a fight. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to see you lost. We wear the name of Christ. So wear it well. It's the name of Christ. It represents and it shows in its entirety ownership, connection, and belonging. As you move forward, of course, past your Christian church, you be that church. Let's pray. God, that old song, may all who come behind us find us faithful. We are here on the 21st century, 2023, some 2,000 years removed from those early believers, those early believers who were called upon to give their all, the last full measure because of their faith. Father, help us to focus our minds and our hearts and our will on your will, on your purpose for us to be the people you've called us to be, to be the church you've called us to be. Father, we wear the name Christian proudly. 
Give us the strength and the courage to defend it to our death or until you come. In Jesus' name. Bruce, brother, thank you for that powerful message. It's challenging to us. And it could be that there's somebody that was challenging a way that you need to make a decision tonight. We want to give you that opportunity. Maybe you wear the name of Christ, but you need to get in the fight, like Bruce reminded us of. Maybe you're at a place where you just need to, to come forward and, and recommit the commitment that you made at one other time. Maybe you just need prayer. You need some encouragement. Or maybe... You've not become part of this family, this heritage, this genealogy in Christ. And the wonderful thing about this family is because of what God did through Jesus Christ, anybody can come into it. And if you want into it through Jesus' blood, this opportunity is given to you to come forward and we'll talk about what it means to believe in Christ, but to turn to him, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, to join your life to his life, to have your sins forgiven and be filled with the Spirit of the living God. If you're at a place where you need to make that decision, we want to give you that opportunity. If you would please stand. We're going to be singing this hymn. If you need prayer, you need a decision made, please come forward during this time. Thank you again to Percy and the singers. God bless you all for being here. We thank you deeply. And thank you, Brother Bruce, also for your message. And prayerfully, we take to heart what has happened here tonight. and We leave these walls, and we do like those Christians did in Antioch all those years ago and make an impact in the world around us. Let's pray, and then we'll dismiss. Lord God Almighty, we give thanks to you because you are a God who is good. You are merciful, you are gracious, and you are compassionate. You have made a way for us to come to you regardless of where we've been, regardless how far we have run from you, Lord. We, we never find ourselves out of the reach of your call and of your love. We thank you for sending Jesus to make all the difference in our lives. Lord, we thank you for your life-giving spirit that you've made to dwell in us, to equip us and to embolden us to be your witnesses in places where we're comfortable, but also places where we are not. Lord, we pray that as we leave these walls, that we will be the church. Help us to be salt. Help us to be light. To your glory, to your honor, for the salvation of the nations. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.